Hello and welcome to my presentation on the intersectionality of GSRD and neurodivergent identities from pathologisation to pride. My name is Nathan Osborne and I'm an integrative counsellor. I'm also a Pink Therapy Advanced Accredited Gender, Sex and Relationship Diversity Therapist. I work in private practice and occasionally deliver training on queer identities and intersectionality. Please note that during this presentation, I'll be using the correct language that I have available to the best of my knowledge at this time. Language in the GSRD and neurodiversity field are constantly changing, so when you watch this, the language may be outdated. To start, I'd like to explain what intersectionality is. Intersectionality was first coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. The Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as created overlapping and inter interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Someone's intersectional identity can include racial identity, gender identity, sexuality, disability, and nationality. Other categories, categories can also be included, but this gives you an idea of the systems of oppression in which people face. And this is relevant to this presentation because we are discussing neurodivergence, which may be included in disability, depending on how you view it, and gender identity and or sexuality. And of course, neurodivergent GSRD people may identify with more oppressed intersections. For example, I'm a mixed race neurodivergent male with a trans history. Next, I'd like to explain what GSRD means. GSRD is an acronym which stands for Gender, Sex and Relationship Diversity. The National Counseling Society defines GSRD as an all-encompassing term GSRD positions gender, sexuality and relationships as broad categories rather than specific singular identities, such as, for example, LGBT. It allows for the recognition of shades within sexuality and gender, and that we humans are so much more complex than a definitive relationship. This is allowing us to acknowledge and embrace our nuances. Throughout this presentation, you may hear me reference GSRD people as queer, as this is also a term that has been reclaimed by the community in recent years. So, what is the difference between neurodiversity and neurodivergence? You may have heard or seen both terms be used, which can be confusing. Neurodiversity is the term used to express that individuals possess different neurotypes. Some of what is termed neurotypical, their neurotype is considered to be reflective of the majority of the population or typical, and others are considered to be neurodivergent. Their neurotype differs from the norm. A neurodivergent refers to an individual whose brain is atypical. Types of neurodiversity include ADHD, Tourette's, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, OCD, and autism. This list is not a definitive list of different neurotypes, but gives you an idea of what we're going to be discussing. Historically, being queer or GSRD has had its challenges and still does today. In 1968, the DSM-2, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, classified homosexuality as a mental disorder. It was only in 1992 that the World Health Organization declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. As we know, homosexuality being pathologized has had a lasting impact on the community. In 1980, 
being transgender was introduced into the DSM-3 and also treated as a disorder. It was only in 2013 that it was replaced with gender dysphoria, distress which transgender may feel rather than the identity. And conversion practice organisations such as Exodus International were founded in 1973 because of the belief that homosexuality and being transgender were simple and or a mental disorder. Despite the declassification, these practices still take place today. So you can see how the stigma is still very much present. Fortunately, in a lot of parts of the world, they're more accepting these days and understand that queer identities are not a mental disorder. And I know that there are many other identities within the GSRD community that I haven't mentioned within this slide that I wanted to acknowledge. A lot like GSRD history, neurodiversity history was heavily pathologised too. Most re research I've found relates to autism. Autism was pathologised and the term refrigerator mother theory was coined by Austrian psychiatrist Leo Kanner in the 1940s. Autism was seen as a sign of failure by the parents and was thought that if the child was autistic, it was because the mother was cold towards the child. It wasn't until the 1970s that this theory was finally debunked. And it wasn't until the 1990s that aut autism was spoken about in a positive light by Jim Sinclair, who himself is autistic. Jim advanced the neurodiversity movement and wrote an informative piece called Don't Mourn For Us which changed how people viewed autism. Many people have been misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all and have struggled through life, which was due to lack of understanding by clinicians, which then leads on to neurodiversity being discriminated against. UK laws do offer some protection for neurodivergent people under the Equality Act of 2010. However, this comes under the umbrella as a disability and not every neurodivergent person considers themselves to be disabled. In 1952, autism was published in the DSM-2 as a psychiatric condition. There have been changes to descriptions throughout the history of the DSM and in 2013, the umbrella diagnosis of Asperger's was removed as there were problematic connotations attached to this and we now have more research. Now that we've briefly explored the history of being queer and neurodivergent, it's important to recognise the double layers of trauma in which people with these identities face. Myers Minority Stress Model describes high levels of stress faced by members of stigmatised minority groups, such as those that I mentioned when I talked about intersectionality. Minority stress may be caused by a number of factors, including poor social support and low socio-economic status, interpersonal prejudice and discrimination, which are things that queer neurodivergent people face. We're now seeing an emergence of queer neurodivergence and I wanted to share some statistics that I found in relation to this. A study found that people who do not identify with the sex they were assigned at birth are three to six times more likely to be autistic than cisgender people. AFAB people, which means assigned female at birth, and cisgender females are persistently underdiagnosed with neurodivergence. ADHD and autism are misdiagnosed by clinicians as other behaviour patterns or conditions in young AFAB people. And this is due to the way in which AFAB people often have a quieter presentation and are socialised as girls and therefore do not have the traditional neurodivergent traits which the diagnostic criteria include. The 2018 study found that almost 70% of autistic people identify as non-heterosexual. Neurodivergence is more common in the LGBTQ plus community than in cishet people. And in the past couple of years, we've also seen a rise in, in queer neurodivergent creators, entertainers and artists. And in the past few years, there seems to have been an emergence of queer neurodivergent therapists. Perhaps 
This is due to feeling a little safer in the world and being able to practice as a therapist without being pathologised ourselves. There is harmful misinformation about the overdiagnosis of certain neurodivergent identities, such as ADHD. However, this is far from the truth within the queer community. GSRD people are less likely to receive the healthcare they need because of discrimination within the healthcare system related to their sexual and or gender identity, which then results in them being less likely to obtain a formal diagnosis and aftercare. One question I hear a lot and I've asked myself is why? Why is there an emergence of queer neurodivergent people? Well, we don't have all of the answers and there has been some research to suggest that neurodivergent people are less likely to adapt to social norms and that they're more likely to question and explore their gender and or sexual identities. However, we fall into the trap of pathologisation if we continue to ask why. Much like questioning somebody's gender identity and or sexuality, there needs to be an acceptance of queer neurodivergence. And due to the many layers of financial, inaccessible and discriminatory barriers that often prevent marginalised people from receiving formal diagnosis, self-diagnosis is generally accepted, especially since the amount of neurodivergent support services, specifically for adults, is incredibly limited, particularly for queer people too. And for many people, self-diagnosis empowers people's understanding of themselves and they're able to seek out self-help resources and tools. Now that more and more people are coming out as queer and neurodivergent, I wanted to understand how people felt about their identity. So I asked five people who identify as GSRD and neurodivergent if they felt pride in their identity. And these are some of the things that they said. Yes, I feel pride, although sometimes I feel more pride in my queerness than I do in my neurodivergent identity. This is perhaps because I came out at a young age, whereas I was diagnosed as an adult. So it's something I'm still processing. Someone else said, I think taking pride in my queer sexuality and gender has helped me to move past shame in other areas which are also coded by society as failings and not normal. This being queer has helped me a lot in also finding pride in being dyslexic and dyspraxic. Someone else said, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't and I feel ashamed of it. There are two intersections here, being neurodivergent and being queer. Being queer in my Asian culture and family has been difficult. Being neurodivergent is harder. It's invisible and I'm classed as odd and different. Another person said, yes, and there are lots of layers to that. There's something I find very empowering about embracing these parts of who I am and choosing to label myself when society at large is intent on othering people like me, especially when the words queer and autistic only ever had negative connotations for me growing up. Choosing to see difference as something to be celebrated. Taking pride in my identity is a radical act of self-love, but in doing so is also an act that singles me out as other. And someone else said, yes, as I've gotten older, more so, but there is still some shame, but less and less. As you can hear from the different accounts from people, the things that impact them are the issues that I've previously discussed in the presentation. On the whole, the response was generally that they feel some pride in their queer neurodivergent identity. I wonder if I'd have asked the same questions 10 years ago if I'd have got the same response. I also asked the same five people what would be helpful to GSRD neurodivergent people going to therapy and this is what they said. I'd expect my therapist to be aware of neurodivergence. I don't want my therapist to expect me to be responding in normative ways of working 
which feels like conversion therapy. I'd find it helpful if my therapist could ask me more questions than make assumptions, as neurodivergence can vary from people to people. Be curious. Finally, I'd like my therapist to be able to make me comfortable with my ableism. Someone else said, it'd be helpful for a therapist to ask for pronouns. I want to know about my neurodiverse identity from the start. I might not want to share that, but just being asked it in the initial chat or email inquiry or first meeting might make me feel like I'm in a safe place. It might give me scope to be able to reflect on the intersections of my identity in relation to the context of therapy. I'd also want to know that they had training in LGBTQIA plus therapy. Someone else said, it being clear that the therapist understands neurodivergence as a difference and not always a disability. Another said, having a way to signal potential queer neurodivergent clients that your room will be a safe space for them is important in that initial first step. Another important thing to bear in mind is endeavouring to approach the client's lived experience with an attitude of humility instead of defensiveness when what is normal for them does not match up with what you consider normal. Therapy is a space that I don't need to selectively hide parts of who I am. And someone else said, clarity around things like timekeeping, where I go when I first arrive and payment. I like options to book online and payment online. Counselling should be a non-judgmental space, but further acceptance of the difference that queer and neurodivergent people face is super important. No assumptions, because everyone is different. As you can hear from these accounts, taking someone's intersectional identity into account and bringing that into the session is important to people's therapeutic journey and their own sense of self. So if you aren't seeing all of the client's intersections, are you really seeing them at all? And finally, if you'd like to find out further information about anything I've discussed during this presentation, here are the links to the references I've used. Thank you for taking the time to watch and or listen to my presentation today.